This weekend, while in the Atlanta airport, we attempted to make a reel, walking and talking our way through the airport like our dear friend Carlos Whitaker. We were excited that we didn't run into anything or fall down. (laughs) Walking, talking, and recording is a lot for the two of us. I ran into something. (laughs) But it is. You're exactly right. We tagged Carlos and he left us some fun comments. We love that guy. Yes, we do. And we really love the work he's doing. In a world more connected and yet lonelier than it's ever been, Carlos Whitaker is bringing humans together all over the world. Backed by the power of a massive Insta Familia, his enthusiastic social followers tune in daily to join forces with Carlos to find connection, do good and be in community. In his podcast, Carlos creates a space where people are safe to engage in conversation about the topics that matter most. His motto is, don't stand on issues, walk with people. Uh, Check out episode one called How to Be a Governor with Sharon McMahon. It is so good. Or episode 45, being happily married with opposing hot topic views with <laughs> with Heather Whitaker. We also love Heather Whitaker, and that is a super fun episode. You could even check out our episodes with Carlos. We have loved being guests on his podcast. Yes, we have. Check out all that our friend Carlos is doing on the podcast and through the Insta Familia. You will thank us later. Hey friends, welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. And I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we're so glad you joined us for this conversation. Let's dive in. Kelly, we are losing our minds that we're getting to have this conversation with you. You cannot know how long we have loved and respected your work and oh, appreciate thanks. you and just thanks over the moon about you saying yes to this conversation. Seriously, you, which is so funny to have uh, an experience with you side aside from books and all those things, but you are one of our favorite voices in the whole world. Like top oh. five people that we've wanted on our podcast. Seriously. Dang. Seriously. I wish your publisher could track how responsible I am for a lot of your book sales. I wish that were possible. (laughs) And then maybe send me a royalty check from time to time. I'm convinced I've sold a lot of copies of The Middle Place for sure. I know, me too. All of them. Well, it's the easiest pitch. I was just retelling it because I was with all these um, 35-year-olds at a wedding this past weekend. And they were asking me, like, how did did it all start? Mm. And I went back to the story of The Middle Place and driving up and down 95 with my dad to take my daughters to meet his brothers and sisters and the phone calls coming through. We have your first offer. We have your second offer. Wow. Yes, I mean, Schuster would like to talk to you. Random house. It was, you know, like a total thrill. Like it was the thing I wanted the most in the world, other than being a mom. It was the thing I wanted. Like if you went back in my journals, it'd be like, I wanted to lose 20 pounds. <laughs> I wanted to quit smoking mm. and I wanted to be a writer. Mm. And I actually got it. I got the thing I wanted, which I just think is so rare. Well, you I have, mean, tons of things I didn't get sure. that I also wanted, but this was what I wanted the most for sure. Well, you have blown it out, blown it out of the park, hit it out of the park. I'm mixing my metaphors, but I mean, blown it out of the water. Thank hit you. Hit it out of the park. <laughs> you sure We're have. We're flexible here. Yes. All those things. I mean, yeah. I remember reading the tell me more chapter of the book, tell me more and thinking this should be required reading for every parent of a child who's about to turn 13. Like every parent of an adolescent needs to read this and lock this wisdom in this mindset. If you could just operate from this place, you can't even imagine how much easier that would make the overall journey of parenting a teenager. Well, let's just say that right now, if you're listening and you are one of the only people that lives under a rock and is not familiar (laughs) with Kelly, then go buy that book right now. However old your kids are, tell me, buy all of our books, but that one first, start with that one. We did a um, five part series on intellectual humility on Mm -hmm. the podcast, Kelly Corrigan Wonders, this, the beginning of this year, beginning of 2023. And intellectual humility is just like the ongoing appreciation that there's always things you don't know about the person, about the situation, about the context. And 
it's a very hard practice to to keep alive, actually. Mm. Like it's very, it's much more common that we think we know. We know what the kids should do. We know that other friend of theirs is bad news. We know it wasn't her fault. We know it was her fault. We know the teacher's right. We know the teacher's wrong. We know she should play defense, not offense. <laughs> you, you know, like yes. the, it, I think part of the urgent emotional experience that is parenting is this either feeling that you know or feeling that you must know. Mm-hmm. Like you, you feel sort of slightly uncertain that that nothing could be more uncomfortable. You're like, this is life and death stuff. Like I'm the one, I'm supposed to know. I'm supposed to be the world's expert on this kid. Yes. And intellectual humility would say, just keep saying, tell me more. Mm-hmm. What else? Go on. Mm-hmm. Tell me more. What else? Go on. Like it's almost like a song that we should teach people like the ABCs. Like, yes. tell me more, what else? Go on. Because there's so much hiding behind the presenting issue. Like whatever it is, I, Emily didn't invite me to a party. There's like seven things lower than that, deeper than that, that are really what's at stake here. Mm. But it's such a cheap thrill to feel like you solved the presenting issue And I have had this experience more than once where I realized only after the fact, sometimes weeks or months after the fact, that I got high off of thinking I solved the problem, that I untied the knot for them. And they were kind of either rolling their eyes or laughing at me or biting their tongue the whole time. Mm. Because they were like, she, whatever, she's on a roll. She thinks she's got it. She doesn't even know. Like, I didn't even get to say the whole thing about Emily and Jenny and Tracy and the park and the the thing I did last week and whatever. And, you know, it's like, just do this. <laughs> like ju- the word yes. just, I think is like, should also be like a red flag word mm. for all of us. Like yes. if you're saying just when someone's upset, I don't, I don't think it's a mm. just situation. Mm. Yes. I've thought about that with the word actually, but never the word just. My God, that was so funny. That's my, both of my kids glommed on to actually, like in, the, in their big girl way. You know, as four-year-olds, they'd be like, actually, I feel the banana now. I'm like, well done, you. Everything was actual for a while. Yes. And everything was literal. Remember literally? Remember yes. That? Yes. Literally. I'm in that with my nephew right now, literally. <laughs> well, I, I mean, I love what you're saying too about questions. And we talk, I mean, we are talking so much about anxiety with, kids and families. And one of the things we talk about with questions, I mean, not only are you learning more, but you are implying capability to your kids. Like you have the the ability to figure this out and it's, it's not all up to me. And that's such a gift to them in developing independence, all the things that you know and talk about. Implied capability is a great concept. Mm. I haven't heard it phrased that way before. I really, that really works for me Mm. because that's a whole set of behaviors like that. I was just talking to somebody else um, this past weekend and we were talking about the face of love, which is what my husband and I sort of are, are code words for show them that you imply capability, show them that you're sure they're going to work it out. And we say it because my dad was a big face of love guy. Like when you looked at him, his face was like, go on. What else? (laughs) Yeah. Tell me more, lovey. That's great. Unbelievable. And so sometimes I'll get in problem solving mode and then he'll say, and I'll just, I'll just switch mm. into like this messaging that's nonverbal, that's implying capability. Like even just eye contact and stopping what you're doing can be a mistake. Mm. Like for instance, George, my daughter George was telling me something that's kind of complicated and I was doing a puzzle. And to imply capability would mean that I would continue to do the puzzle. To panic, to feel afraid, to feel that this was a big deal, I would stop doing the puzzle. Mm. And I would look at her and I might put my hands up and I might send all these nonverbal signals that like, holy smokes, this is bad. You know? Yes. Yeah. So good. We already have 30 things, 30 takeaways for parents. Yes, we do. And we're only eight minutes into our conversation. Will you tell her the tell it to your face story? Oh, and yes. Who, you'll love this story. So we have a dear friend who had a teenage son who, when he was in that really complicated 13 to 15 space, would come down frequently in the mornings, wouldn't speak to a single family member, would grab the cereal box and just start pouring his breakfast. And she had tried 
so hard to help him connect some dots around what he was communicating non-verbally, not just in their home, but outside of their we home. We should say she's a very direct friend. Yeah, she also. is. And a riot. And she had made desperate attempts that didn't seem to be working. And so one day he walked down and she said, oh my goodness, are you okay? And, she, and he was like, yes. And she was like, are you sure? Are you sure you're not sick? And he was like, no. Should I take your temperature? He's like, no. She goes, okay, well, be sure and tell your face before you leave the house today. <laughs> it's her desperate attempt to help him make some connections. Yes. When he could Did not. Work? Tell me it worked. <laughs> yes. It's so good. Isn't that no. great? Tell your face. Tell your yeah. face. The face of love is a much kinder, it is gentler a much reminder. Kinder. Well, that goes to like our like relationship to sort of bridge the gap. Like mm. you can, I know people who shall not be named <laughs> who swear that they love another person. It's not palpable. And if it's not palpable, then you're not finished. Like if it hasn't crossed over, if it's not being, if, if you don't know that they can feel it, mm. then kind of like, what good is it? Like, it can't be so abstract that it's like, I don't know. I feel like the responsibility or the promise that you're making is that I, I can, I will love you and you will know it. Which goes to like the abending of the golden rule, which is it's not how I would like to be treated. It's how you would like to be treated. Yes. If I know that you like space. So I have a kid who likes space. I myself am not big on space. <laughs> I'm more into the snuggling and the talking and weeping and holding each other. And, you know, like I'm an emotional creature and she's independent. and. She once said to me, know me, mm. know me. And it was so powerful because it was such a, it's such a primal request. Like stop giving me what you would want mm. and give me what I would want. And we've laughed about it since because like my brothers, when I was growing up would give me, give me, they would take me to like a Flyers game. Philadelphia Flyers. I was, like, I was, I was about to say, who are the Flyers? <laughs> yeah. Okay, sorry. And, Raise your backs. I got not the Flyers. Yeah. And I don't care about ice hockey, mm. but they didn't seem to know it. Mm. They didn't know me. And then I was sort of required to be like, thank you. Thank you so much. And then we'd be out in the world and they'd be like, we took Kelly to a Flyers game. And I was like, really? I would have rather gone to like a gymnastics meet. Like what would have been amazing is if you had taken me to something you didn't like, but I did. Because nothing is more powerful than feeling mm. like you're known. So it's just kind of interesting that, that link from loving someone to making sure that it's palpable mm. to making sure that it's palpable in a way that indicates clearly that like you've got them in mind, not you in mind. Mm. Yeah. That's so good. So hard. So good. It's so hard. So it's yeah. not reflex. It's right. not like your, it's your instincts that they're really tuned to something else. I don't know what they're tuned to and I don't know why, mm -hmm. but they're not, I don't think our instincts are quite right. Mm. Yeah. Unfortunately, I don't ourselves. think like trust your gut. And I actually think parenting involves a lot of self-control mm. and consideration, which is, I find a little maddening. Mm. Like I just want to relax and enjoy and everybody be themselves. <laughs> but I feel like that's not really the job sometimes. Yeah. You know, there's, there's whole periods where it's just the days coming and going and there's, there's none of this headiness. But when things are, you know, in motion, if you will, if, if growth is happening, wink, wink, you have to be a little more conscious of your next move. You know what I mean? Well, so that brings me to, um, I, I just released a book and quoted you. Congratulations. In it. Thank you. Or and, free parents. Oh, look at you. You're so sweet. Thank you. Yeah. So, which is a wink, wink too, because that's what we're working on. We're not there yet, but, um, but you, but this quote, I love you say, raising people is not some lark. It's serious work with serious repercussions. It's air traffic control. You can't step out for a minute. You can barely pause to scratch your ankle. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I love that so much. I know. And I, I've been a huge challenge for me is like, am I overreacting or underreacting? Mm. Like, am I, you know, because you, you can't be sort of ever vigilant. But sometimes I feel like just when I relax, especially in conversation where maybe I've been biting my tongue about something or being kind of that cagey, but really careful in what I'm saying. Mm. 
And then I feel, okay, things people are getting older. I can I could be more honest. I could tell them something about my own youth, or I could share an opinion about something. And almost always like that kind of comes back to bite me in the butt. So it, it I do feel like it's air traffic control. Like I don't feel like you can, you know, avert your gaze. Mm. Unfortunately. Mm. I mean, I there are moments, there are afternoons, mm. you know, there might be a Sunday. The thing that's happening is that you're so, you're like 10x the power of all other people on the planet. Mm. So your words are so big for them. Like sometimes I'm like, God, I'd kill to be your aunt or your teacher or your lacrosse coach. <laughs> like, I don't want, I don't want this power. I yes. don't want it to be like one time my mom said to me. Mm. Sissy, I spoke in Wisconsin this weekend and I talked about rupture and repair. That's great. I think kids need to practice repairing the relationship when they've said or done something to hurt a friend or a family member. Well, I need to practice repair with you right now. Uh Uh-oh, what happened? I accidentally ate a few of your mosh bars. (laughs) I know you love those. How many is a few, David? All the banana bread ones. All of them? Yes, but it was an accident. My brother-in-law, Aaron, ate all the cookies and cream one. That strangely makes me feel better. Well, you can repair the relationship by getting me some more. I am ordering some with our code right now. And I feel great about this purchase because Mosh Bars are not only good for you, they are doing good in the world. I love their mission. Mosh is a company founded by Maria Shriver and her son, Patrick Schwarzenegger, with a simple mission to create a conversation about brain health through food, education, and research. Maria's father suffered from Alzheimer's, and since then, she and Patrick have dedicated themselves to finding ways to help other families dealing with this debilitating disease. Mosh joined forces with the world's top scientists and functional nutritionists to go beyond your average protein bar. With six delicious flavors, each Mosh bar has 12 grams of protein and is made with ingredients that support brain health, like ashwagandha, lion's mane, collagen, and omega-3s. Can you say ashwagandha three times as fast as you can? I cannot and I won't. But here's the best part about Mosh to make you feel good. Mosh donates a portion of all proceeds from your order to fund gender-based brain research through the women's Alzheimer's movement. Why gender-based? Two-thirds of all Alzheimer patients are women. Mosh is working closely to close the gap between women and men's health research. I need to mention they also have a line of plant-based protein bars in three delicious flavors. As I have already confessed, I love the banana bread. If you want to find ways to give back to others and fuel your body and your brain, Mosh Bars are the perfect choice for you. Head to moshlife.com slash RBG to save 20% off plus free shipping on either the Best Sellers Trial Pack or the new Plant-Based Trial Pack. That's 20% off plus free shipping on either the best seller or plant-based trial pack at M-O-S-H-L-I-F-E dot com slash RBG. Thank you, Mosh, for sponsoring this episode. David, how did your meeting with the financial planner go? Well, I'd say we got somewhere between a B minus and a C plus from our time. (laughs) What did you get a good report on? He did praise us for getting term life insurance when our kids were really young. Getting term life insurance to protect your kids is one of the smartest financial decisions you can make. Fabric by Gerber Life makes it simple to protect your family's financial future. So you can focus on what's ahead, knowing your family is protected if something unexpected happens. Fabric by Gerber Life was designed by parents for parents to help you get a high quality, surprisingly affordable term life insurance policy in less than 10 minutes. Fabric has flexible policies that fit your family and your budget with quality policies like a million dollars in coverage for less than a dollar a day. It's all online and on your schedule. No appointments, scheduling, or piles of paperwork. Just apply when it's convenient for you. You could go from start to covered in less than 10 minutes with no health exam required. There's no risk to apply. They have a 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can cancel at any time. 
Fabric has partnered with Gerber Life, trusted by millions of families like yours for over 50 years. With over 1,800 five-star reviews, they're rated as excellent on Trustpilot. And Fabric has more than just life insurance. It's a one-stop shop that also has free digital wills, investment accounts that let you save for your kid's future, and you can manage your family's finances right from your phone so your family is prepared for anything. Join the thousands of parents who trust Fabric to protect their family. Apply today in just minutes at meetfabric.com slash RBG. That's meetfabric.com slash RBG, M-E-E-T, fabric.com slash RBG. Policies issued by Western Southern Life Assurance Company, not available in certain states. Prices subject to underwriting and health questions. Sissy, tell folks what happened when we went to Atlanta this week. Oh, we had an amazing experience. My dear friend, Ford Fry, who is the brilliant chef behind so many beloved restaurants across the country, Marcel, The Optimist, King and Duke, Little Ray, Super Rica, just to name a few, came to dinner with us, with his wife at Super Rica in Atlanta. I am still thinking about that meal and that time with he and his wife. How often do you get to have dinner with the chef? And he coached us on everything to order. And I ordered enough food for a family <laughs> of four myself. It was all so good. To offset the amount of tacos, queso, and guacamole we consume, I thankfully remember to pack my high of vitamins. Do you mean the kids' vitamins you take as a grown-up? I'm a kid at heart, <laughs> and that qualifies me. Typical children's vitamins are basically candy in disguise, filled with two teaspoons of sugar, unhealthy chemicals, and other gummy junk rowing kids should never eat. That's why Haya was created, the pediatrician-approved, super-powered, chewable vitamin. Haya fills in the most common gaps in modern children's diets to provide the full-body nourishment our kids need with a yummy taste they love. Formulated with the help of nutritional experts, Haya is pressed with a blend of 12 organic fruits and veggies, then supercharged with 15 essential vitamins and minerals, including vitamin D, B12, C, zinc, folate, and many others to help support immunity, energy, brain function, mood, concentration, teeth, bones, and more. I need all that. Haya is designed for kids of all ages, as David has proven, and sent straight to your door so there is one less thing to worry about. I love that they ship straight to your door. Parents and people who travel like we do have one less thing to worry about. We've worked out a special deal with Haya for their best-selling children's vitamin. Receive 50% off your first order. To claim this deal, you must go to HayaHealth.com slash RBG. This deal is not available on their regular website. Go to H-I-Y-A-H-E-A-L-T-H dot com slash R-B-G and get your kids the full body nourishment they need to grow into healthy adults. Well, speaking of the power of parents, we just were talking about your new book and Kelly, you have released a book recently. We talked about all the books of yours we love. Mm -hmm. Tell Me More, Glitter and Glue, The Middle Place. But you've released a children's book called Hello World. And we'd just love to ask you, tell us a little bit about what made you want to write that and what you hope not just kids but grownups could gain from reading it. So I think there's this fundamental and extremely dangerous cultural moment that's pushing us to think about self over other rather than other over self. And yes. I think thinking about self a lot in a therapeutic sense with your friends, as you're reading, however you organize your social media feeds, like whatever's pointing back at you, is probably not anybody's idea of what makes a person really happy and light in the world. Like I think if you read thousands of years of philosophy or theology, you would not find that thinking about self and talking about self is the road mm. to like a kind of a peaceful existence. And I think at a superficial level, you're either talking about yourself or you're asking questions. And I believe that asking questions is probably like the simplest interpersonal habit that would take you 
put you on the road to like a great life. Mm. And I know this because I witnessed it because my father was like the world's greatest question asker. And people phrase this differently. They say, you know, be curious, not judgmental. Mm. They say, um, take an interest in the world around you. And I, of course, agree with both those statements. I just think they can be vague. So what I'm saying is learn how to ask great questions and do it all the time. Like become a question asker at on the bus, at the dinner party, in the meeting, in the hallway. Learn who people are because the rewards are off the charts. <laughs> like everybody, I really know this because I've, I've done it. Everybody has a story. Mm. Everybody is interesting. That is not a cliche. That is a fact. And, you know, you can only think about one thing at a time. So I'm either thinking about you or I'm thinking about me. <laughs> and thinking mm. about you will make it for a better day. Mm. For sure. At, at, at a really selfish level. Like I think, to what if everybody who was in therapy, like before their hour of therapy, they had to just sit with someone else and ask that person questions for an hour. Like what, what does it do to you mm. to be giving somebody that much of your attention and interest? It's so flattering and it's so enlarging f for the listener. Yeah. And people, when I've written all these books and of course doing this podcast and I have a show on PBS called Tell Me More. Yes. And it's like I'm a professional question asker and all of the answers are what's getting woven into the books. Because I, I know things and it's not from my own experience. It's from asking better questions. And then the way that people get less than what they could in the question asking department is they ask one question, but it's like the third question or the fourth question. That's where all the juicy stuff is. Mm. And I think there's a rumor that people feel that you're being nosy. And I just feel that's very rare. I, I And I feel they'll tell you, I feel they'll evade you a little bit. If you're going towards something that's kind of tender or uncomfortable, you'll know. They'll, their face will flush or they'll answer the question slightly off center or they'll try to change the topic. And so you can just be tuned into that. I mean, I'm not saying like drive to the, the heart of a <laughs> Expose person. Expose the vulnerability, right. But even just finding out like where someone's from and what that town's like and did you like high school and who are your parents and um, what are their names? Like I always want to know people's parents' names because mm. there, there's always something that happens right then. I'll say, what's your parents' name? She'll say, Joan. And then they'll say, there'll be a little pause and then they'll say, Joni Baloney. <laughs> call her Joni Baloney because... <laughs> She just made up so many tall tales and you should have, you know, so it doesn't have to be, you know, what keeps you up at night or what, when was the last time you had a panic attack? Mm. It's more just, who are you? Did you like high school? Yeah. Where'd you go to college? How'd you pick it? Like when mm. my girls were in the college application process, they were like, I cannot stand it. Every parent's asking me where I'm applying. And I said, I know there's an inordinate amount of curiosity about this. People really do want to know. I'm not going to gaslight you. The best thing to do is say, where did you go? How did you pick it? Mm. And they will tell you for 30 minutes because nobody ever asks them a question mm. because we're old, and we're boring to people. <laughs> and, and you'll learn a lot. So just flip it. That's such That's a great cool. word. Yes. I mean, just practically the amount of kids going to college that we have both counseled that have talked about that. I love that thought. I would love to tell kids that. Okay, well, so I, I have a question for you about your growing up. So we're in this season of our podcast, we're talking about ages and stages in kids' lives and who they are and what they need. And so we would love to hear what your favorite stage was when you were growing up and why. A, a big part of my growing up is that I had these two older brothers who were really sporty. How much older were they? When I was a freshman in high school, Booker was a junior and GT was a senior. Okay. So we're right in there together. But, but they were very close together and they were very athletic. And so they, that took up a lot of space because people love talking about sports and people know how to talk about sports. So anyone who came over, who are you playing next? Who'd you beat? How many goals did you score? Did you get any assists? Like people could talk about sports forever, which could 
which left me a lot of room to disappear and be creative. And I'm a total extrovert. Like I don't, I don't want to be alone, but if I'm alone, I can come up with stuff. I can really make a day because I like to paint and I like to sew and I tried to make furniture and I would cut my hair and, (laughs) you know, I would try blue eyeshadow and I would put on my mom's outfits and I would write a play and I would take photos with the old (laughs) camera and see if I could get the film to work. And, and I was big into the collage thing, way into the collage thing. So my, my parents had this hall closet and behind the first row of coats, there was kind of nothing. And so I would, it's turned into a bathroom now, this hall closet. I'm still not used to it. I still go to put my coat in there. And, um, Anyway, I would crawl underneath the coats and then be in this back space on the floor and I would put all my stuff on the wall and they let it be my office. And so I have very happy memories of cooking something up, being like a little maker back there while I could hear them in the other room. And I, that's the combination I like. I like to be near the people and I like to listen. I like to overhear while I'm making my little thing. Because I was the only girl and because I was not athletic, nobody knew what to talk to me about. Like there, there, there's plenty of conversation around lacrosse, tennis. My, bro- my brother GT played football his senior year in high school, like out of the blue just for fun and had this insane catch in this very important game. So we talked about that for six months. Like, you know, so being a part of something, but having my own little workshop. Mm. That was a nice combination for me. Sounds like a lot of who you still are, what you're still doing. It feels like it. Yeah. it feels like it feels like that's what I like. Yeah. I was so curious as you were telling that it does feel like a, a picture of who you are mm. and and evidence of where these giftings were emerging in you. Mm. Are there any other moments in growing up where you look back now and think, "Okay, there's more evidence of the work that I'm going to do in this world and where Mm. I was becoming all of who I am. One time I was at this music festival when I was 25 and we were on these blankets and I was lounging around and, you know, there's like long breaks between sets. You just sort of hanging around for an hour. And I just started asking people questions. And this friend of mine who's still a friend of mine today, Sarah Mastracco, all these UVA girls had moved to California and we were all palling around together for a couple of years there. It was so fun. And she said, um, oh my God, you're like Charlie Rose. You're like Barbara Walters. You're like, <laughs> wow. you cannot stop asking questions. And I was like, I know. Mm-hmm. And I, is that bad? Like, uh, you know, is it weird? But I was bored. I, I'm very easily bored by small talk. And a, a, a terrible feeling for me on the flip side of that would be, going to um, have a glass of wine with some suburban women and talking about a diet, a new kind of diet, uh, a new trainer, uh, a new kitchen counter. Like I feel like all of us are pretending to be interested in things that we're actually not. Like I I don't actually think anyone there is really enjoying it. My gut is that the more people you put in a room, the more superficial the conversation becomes. In fact, I used to say to my girls, like, if you're not feeling connected to your friends, do some stuff one-on-one. Like, there's no way that five girls, eight girls palling around together are going to be able to go deep and have, like, a really satisfying conversation. You know, it's too, yeah. it's too risky and there's too many voices. And so just go one-on-one. Mm. Get some more more interesting, faster, that will actually develop your relationship instead of just bouncing along across the surface from one, you know, sort of hang out to another. It's so fun for me to hear you talk about growing up because of knowing Edward. Do you call Uh, him Edward or do you call him Ed? I call him Eddie. Eddie, okay. You you may not call him Eddie. No one (laughs) call him Eddie but me. Does, do people still call him Edward? You have to be like, yeah, you call him Edward. Okay. Well, definitely that's what he was growing up. And I, I mean, I think one of my earliest memories as a kid was playing outside with Edward and he was really close friends with my first cousin, Blair, 
who was oh, yeah. like my brother growing Blair, up. Blair Allen. Yes, Blair yeah. Allen. Yes, who I adore. And so I was, I think, over at Blair's house playing, and we and they lived. I don't remember if they were next to each other or two doors down. Very close. Very close. And so playing outside with the two of them, and and I remember. What I remember about Edward, knowing from really early on, was that he was brilliant and really thoughtful. And and to hear you talk about growing up, it just feels like, yes, yes, it is so easy to see the two of you together based on who he you know was. What, you know what Edward has is um, he has a really long attention span, mm. which is rare in this world. And I don't know if my kids have it. I don't, I don't know if it's been crushed by social media and just like the the pace of scrolling. But I mean, he can, in the morning when we, you know, read the internet and drink our coffee, he's reading really long pieces and he retains them. And that is like, if you want to be specific about his precise type of intelligence, he can fall into something long and complex and he can hold it. So I can fall into something long and complex. I sometimes stop reading because I'm like, yeah, this is getting real wonky for me. I'm pretty good on like the social security (laughs) policy changes of the 70s. And if you ask me an hour later, I'll tell you, I thought it was really good, really persuasive. I loved the writing. And he'll say, right, but how about that thing in 1972? And I'll say, tell me again. What was that part again? So it's easy for me to imagine that he would have been the world's greatest test taker, yes. which I think he was. Yes. Because it, it, retention is just not challenging for him. And then the other thing about him is that he doesn't talk about um, implied capability. Like the, think about how schools imply capability. Like if you can do this one thing really well, if you can receive information and give it back in a format that is satisfactory to some adult, the, your implied capability is massive, which I sort of resent because I, I had a brother who who is enormously capable but not somebody who for whom school is gonna Mm. show off his skills and he's still stuck there he still had to do it for 12 years like that's crazy there's got to be more ways to develop and and manifest Mm. but anyway with edward he never believes that he can't figure it out so and i do and I always think, oh, this is why you got 1,500 on the SATs and I got 1090. Because <laughs> I, I, I would like glance at the question and be like, man, I don't know that one. I'll, I'm going to go with <laughs> And he'd be like, I don't know that one, but I'm sure I can figure it out. Like yes. if I give it 30 seconds or if I read it again or if I write something down and like noodle with the numbers, I can figure it out. Or if I break down the word into its syllables, like I just don't, I, that f- underlying confidence in your ability to solve it comes from years of solving things Mm -hmm. that seemed unsolvable, comes from implied capability that you're getting from teachers and parents. Yes. Comes from what, you know, like Mm -hmm. that's really what, if you could give that to more people, more people would stay with the problem long enough to Mm -hmm. see, oh, I guess it wasn't really that hard. Like it happens to me now for technology where I'm like, I can, I can get the printer working again. You know, for many years I was like, Edward, the printer's (laughs) broken. Like, and he'd be like, did you try this? I'm like, no, you should do it. Like, I don't want to. I don't mm. get it. It's bugging me. I think it hates me. You know, like, but those are feelings that like kids have. Right. The teacher hates me. I'm not good at math. Um, I'm a bad reader. Like these horrible statements, these fixed mindset statements that trap people and block growth. Yes. So it, it's really takes a lot of messaging and a lot of, I'm really into this implied capability. If you can't tell, I've said <laughs> so it like 10 glad. times, like as if it's like a, a term, but it takes a lot of people implying your capability for you to have the growth mindset to yes. be like, well, it's fine. I don't yeah. get it right now, but I probably will. Yes. David, it has been a long time since I've had a puppy long enough to have forgotten how much work it is? Yes. What time did Patches wake you up today? You don't even want to know. What else did she get into? She's into everything. But she's so cute. It's a good thing she's so cute. This morning she was pulling the toilet paper off the roll and running around with it. (laughs) Well, in her defense, we are all kind of obsessed with the real toilet paper around here. 
So you are going to have to cut her some slack. Are you about to give us another history lesson in toilet paper? Well, yes, I am. (laughs) You may want to take notes. The first perforated toilet paper rolls were introduced in 1890, but it wasn't until 1930 that we officially had splinter-free tissue. Prior to that, people just used what was on hand, corn cobs, parchment, (laughs) even pages from the farmer's almanac. I am extremely grateful to have not lived during those times. Me too. The problem is that nowadays we're clear cutting our forests just to make something that we use once and flush down the toilet. That's why I and Patches love real paper. (laughs) Real makes a sustainable toilet paper that contains no trees and instead uses 100% bamboo. Real's paper is certified by the Forest Stewardship Council, meaning that they are responsibly harvesting the bamboo grass that's used for the paper. And you know, David, my neighbor planted bamboo between our houses, and I am thrilled for anyone to cut down bamboo at any time. So I think this is miraculous. Great. And while the other conventional tree-based papers are wrapped in plastic in the grocery aisle, Real Paper's packaging is plastic-free, compostable, and offers free shipping on all orders. Real partners with One Tree Planted, and with every box of Real that you buy, they are funding reforestation efforts across the country. So unlike the other TP that cuts down trees, Real is helping to actively plant them. You think I could volunteer to have the bamboo cut down behind my house for real paper? I think you could. I love companies that provide good products and are doing good work in the world. Me too. Real paper is available in easy, hassle-free subscriptions or for one-time purchases on their website. All orders are conveniently delivered to your door with free shipping in 100% recyclable, plastic-free packaging. If you head to realpaper.com slash rbg, and sign up for a subscription using our code RBG at checkout, you'll automatically get 30% off your first order and free shipping. That's R-E-E-L-P-A-P-E-R dot com slash RBG or enter promo code RBG to get 30% off your first order plus free shipping. So let's stop flushing our forest and try Real's tree-free paper. Real is paper for the planet. Well, you and Edward together have two girls who seem amazing from social media, whatever that means. That's and not, are. but yeah, I, I would believe it based on the two of you. And so thinking about their growing up, they are, how old are they now? 20 and 22. 20 and 22. So almost grown. Yeah. Old what ladies. would you say looking back was a stage that you loved with them and, and why? I had this window where Edward worked really far from home. He had a really long commute, like over an hour. So he would leave at 7 a.m. and come home at 7 p.m. And so he'd be up at, you know, 6 and downstairs at 6.30. And when he would go down the stairs, our stairs creaked. And and Claire's a light sleeper. And so she'd just get up and wander her little kind of sweaty, cottony, soft self into one side of the bed. And then when he would close the door, that would wake up Georgia and she'd get up and come in on the other side of the bed. Mm -hmm. And we started every day for like two years before, before Georgia had to start going to preschool. And before I got sick, I got cancer when they were pretty young, three and just a little baby. Um, That's how we started every day. And it was heaven. And I had, I didn't have anything to do. I was so lucky. I did not have to get up and go to work you know, put on a suit and pretend to be somebody else. I just was relishing this period. And we'd stay in there until like 9.30. I mean, I could stay in bed for a long time. Like I'm sort of a bed bug and I don't have any desire to like get up and exercise or take a shower. That's all very (laughs) optional to me. Um, The only thing I really, would really get me out of bed is caffeine. Mm. And it was heaven. It was total heaven. And we would read and read and read and sing songs and not do anything and just be there together. And I loved it so much. To flip that, what was the hardest stage and why? It's hard to make big decisions in crisis situations and have confidence that this is the right next move. I just officiated a wedding. Wow. And 
one of the things I said is like, you don't know each other as well as you will. Mm. Life will change you. And what you're saying is like, I marry you as you are and as you will be. And every version of you, including the person you will be when the thing happens that no one saw coming. Mm. And that, you know, big or small, I mean, people, there are varying degrees here of quote unquote things happening, but everybody is surprised along the way. There are diagnoses. There are periods of unhappiness. There are bad jobs. There are intolerable bosses. There's a bum knee. There's a hip replacement that you didn't see coming. Someone dies. And in those moments, when, they're, when they involve your children, you're just like hoping to God that you've got it right, that you're, that you're like picking the right path. And you just don't know, you won't know. It's not really knowable, unfortunately. Mm. And it's so important and it's still not knowable. It doesn't make it more knowable. And there's so many expert voices. Too many. And it doesn't really help because a lot of them disagree. Yes. And you really are stuck with you and your partner, if you have one, working it out and making the best call you can make. And you're probably going to hear about it 10 years later. Like that. It, it, so that happens. It still happens where something comes up and it's like, here's my gut. And Edward will say that here's my gut. It's like, God, I hope. And I, and I kind of want to defer like that. If it's really scary, if it's really a hard thing, the instinct is like, great, you go. Right. And, and, but it's all, it's like 49, 51, like 49% of me is like, I have to do this. Like I know better. I can say the words in the right order and the right tone of voice. I know when to stop. I'll leave the room, whatever, whatever. And then the other part of me is like, I don't know. And I'm not going to get it right. And what if I get emotional? And, you know, so there's, there's like parenting moves that are just so impossible to know if you're, who's got to go with if you disagree. And I, I think the only rule of thumb that I would say after being on the job now for 22 years is you always have the option to do nothing or to pause and hold or pause and sit with. Like there is that, that's a move. Mm. You always have the option to learn more. And those feel safer sometimes than like making a statement or a suggestion or requiring something. And those feel more life-giving to your kids in the moment. Yes, yes, for sure, for sure. But you know, there are, there are moments where a kid wants you to tell them what to do. That's true, yes. And probably in that moment, the best thing you could do for them is not tell them what to do. <laughs> what, do you, what do you think? What do you yeah. think? What would happen if? What if you tried, you know, like help them play it out? I don't know, my dad was so great. And his message over and over again was like, you got this, lovey. Like, don't worry. I, I, I promise you. Like, I don't know how it's going to work, but you're a special kid and it's going to work out. This is not how your story goes. He would say that a lot. This is not how your story goes. As if he had read it. Wow. Mm. I kind of like let that be true, you know? But like when Clara was applying to college, I, like we made a mistake that I cannot imagine ever foreseeing as a mistake which is that we were, we just, you know, so optimistic about her chances. Um, and, and, and for some very specific reasons. So like one was that her college counselor said, no one in her grade has taken the course load that she's taken. She's taken the hardest classes of anybody in her graduating class. She took multivariable calculus and was the only student. Wow. Et cetera. And I thought that that'll, that they say that that really matters. Every you go on these college tours, they say like, uh, you know, we really look at like how difficult or, you know, how challenging are you, is your coursework? And yeah, she had a great GPA and she had great SATs and whatever. She got shot down by like 10 schools in a row. And at some point she yelled at us and said, stop it. Like, you don't know. I'm not going to get in. I'm not a good applicant. And you're making it worse. Like all this confidence that you have in me is making it way worse. I'm not a good applicant. She's like, I'm a great kid and I'm a smart kid and I can do a lot of things. That doesn't mean that the pieces of paper that are representing me to these strangers out there in the world who are also looking at 25,000 other pieces of paper that are representing 25,000 other 3D people, like I'm not gonna win in the comparison. I'm not the class president. I didn't go to Africa. 
I don't have any like special. And she's like, and I know it. And you guys don't know it. And the more you say, trust me, the more I like want to punch you. Like, I don't Mm. trust you. Why should I trust you? You don't know anything about this. I'm the one who's going through all the, uh, you know, we have like assemblies at school where they tell us. I'm looking on all the websites. Like I know exactly what it takes to get into these schools and I only have part of it. And it was like, God, if you had told me it was a mistake to blow a lot of optimism into a kid. And what we were trying to convey is like, you're so special, which is true of all of our kids. I mean, listen, if any of them could really be got, really be known by the people who are making these choices, there would be different choices. What she was saying is, you're, you're like ratcheting it up. You're making it so much worse. So what would you say to parents in that scenario that are preparing? I mean, haven't had two. That- it is so hard because on the flip side, Georgia was applying. She applied early to BC, um, Notre Dame, and Georgetown. And after it was all, the, all the applications were in, she said, what do you think is going to happen? And I should have said, I have no idea. Mm. But, you know, she was like desperate for something. And, and it was one, this is a perfect example of one of those moments where you're like, I think I can let down my guard. Like, I think I can say the real thing. She seems calm. She seems like she's really looking for an authentic answer here. And I was like, here's what I think is going to happen. I think you're going to get into BC. I think you're going to get um, deferred by Notre Dame, but then get in in the spring. And I think you're going to get deferred by Georgetown, waitlisted, then you're going to get in and then you're going to go. I was like, that, that's what I think. And she was crushed. Really? She was like, you don't think I'm going to get into Georgetown, which is where mm. she really wanted to go. And I was like, I don't know. All of a sudden I was like backpedaling, like, I don't know. Why are you looking at me? Who cares? I'm like a 50 year old woman in California. Like, don't, who cares what I think? Why would you even ask me? But in my head, I was like, I'd always, what I was really trying to do was give her hope for the long run. That's like, look, this might not play out until like May. And we had this great friend, Olivia, who had, you know, gotten shot down in ED and then pushed into the regular pile, then pushed into the summer. And then she actually ended up going to Brown, like where she wanted to go. And it was like, I had just watched that. And, and the Olivia and her mom are super together people. And it was like, that could happen. Like, so I just wanted to open up the possibility that that could happen to Georgia. And that she was so crushed. She's like, I can't believe you don't think I can get into Georgetown. I'm like, I don't think of it like that. I don't think they're like meeting you and talking to you and deciding on you. So anyway, she got an early decision to Georgetown and she loved it. And it was a real happy ending. But man, did that moment make her mad. Mm. And, you know, like two weeks later, she's. I heard her say to Edward, mom doesn't think I'm going to get in. <laughs> like, that's not what I said. Yes. Which circles back to questions. Questions seem like they're always a great route. Yes. What do you think? Kelly, what would you say is, thinking back, some of the best parenting advice you've been given? Say less. Mm. It's really an ego. I mean, I'm feeling it right now because you're asking my opinions and I'm feeling very like, oh, this is kind of fun to like (laughs) give you my thoughts on everything. (laughs) It's a real, it's like a temptation of the ego Mm. to think I'm going to give you my advice my excellent advice and you're going to hear it and it's going to change your life. And you're going to come back 20 years later and be like, my mom was amazing. She gave me the best advice, but that's not really the game you're playing. The game you're playing is that she would grow up and think I can, I can really count on myself. I, I bounce. I can get out of any jam. I always pull it out. Not my mom saved me or my mom told me, or I always used to call my mom and my mom would say, So, and again, I mean, I keep referring to this wedding, but it was a very powerful experience because we spent like three days hanging around with these kids who are all 30 to 35 years old and they're all starting their families and getting married and, and they were asking us for advice and it was so fun to give it to people who wanted it. Mm. But for the most part, when you're advising your children, you're probably doing it on an incomplete information set. Like you're probably wrong about like, 40 to 50% of it, they're probably tolerating you. Like they've probably given up in their mind of like, they're not listening. I'm just going to let her say her little thing, her little homily. And then I'm going to go upstairs and call my friend and see if she can figure it out with me or look at TikTok and see if somebody there knows. (laughs) Really? Like they're not. (laughs) So true. The other thing I've learned 
to pass along is um, they know everything you're going to tell them. Mm. They know everything about food and sugar mm-hmm. and um, caffeine and like all our little things like, oh, don't drink a Diet Coke at four o'clock in the afternoon. You're not going to sleep. They, they know it all. They know everything about college admissions, like up to their eyeballs. It's like bleeding out their ears. You don't need to tell them anything. They don't, you don't need to tell them when they should start writing their essays or like maybe putting some ideas on paper or do you want to put a list together? They're, they know. People are telling them that. The whole culture is telling them things all the time. So it'd be nice if they came in your house and you weren't talking at them as well. Mm. You would just, just receive like potted plant, just be there. So when they look over, <laughs> there you are. But like, don't pile on. Mm-hmm. They're telling them everything. Don't go on social media. Don't put your phone in your bed. All of it. They, they, all that messaging is loud and clear. You do not need to echo it. Mm-hmm. Don't pile on. Say less. less. Say less. Which is weird because you have like built up this lifetime of knowledge and life experience and you never loved anybody more. And all you want to do is give it to them. Like that, I thought that was the whole point. I thought that's what I was doing. <laughs> was like saving up all of these stories so that as needed in the perfect moment, I could tell them to the people I love the most and therefore make their lives easier. And that is not at all what is happening. (laughs) Not at all. Maybe grandchildren, maybe nieces and nephews, but you are not that that's not what's happening, Mm. which is like someone should have told me that. Mm. I totally thought that's what the point of all my suffering was, was to decrease theirs. And it's not. It's maybe maybe the point of the sort of highs and lows. It's not to spare your children, but to connect with others. Like mm. we're all connected now, the yeah. three of us. Yes. Because we are we know what we're talking about. Yeah. We all know that we've lived it. I mean, so maybe that's the use of the pain. Mm. Maybe that's where we're supposed to redirect it is mm. to like bonding with one another and caring for one another and holding each other and supporting each other. But it's not to be like rearranged and organized and delivered to your children as homilies. It's not, that's not how they learn. It's, it's the worst way to learn. And that goes back to, I mean, the idea, I mean, I think even as, as therapists, I mean, obviously we're not telling our stories to our people that we're sitting with, but the stories that we have experienced, hopefully emotionally we're bringing to them. And it deepens yes. us in a way that we can connect with them. And so maybe it's back to the love face, the face of love. Face of love, but it's also implied capability because you survived. <laughs> right. You survived your childhood. You survived the, the process. You survived mm-hmm. being on high school teams, not getting asked to the prom, get, getting rejected by the college, having a boss who hated you. You survived. You are a standing example mm. of somebody who's here and living a life with some purpose and some connection. You imply capability just by being here. Like I love, I've given graduation speeches in my day, which is such a great assignment. And I just love telling the audience like you, you know, cause they introduced me all nice. Like, oh, she's the author of four New York Times bestselling authors and a top 1% podcast and a show on PBS. And I'm like, hi, I'm Kelly. I got 1090 on my SATs. I was suspended from high school. I was arrested for shoplifting as a 10th grader. I got into one college. So that's who's really talking to you today. (laughs) Oh, that's so good. Fantastic. Yes. That's a really good thing to remember. Is same place. You weren't that great either. Yeah. Like if you, whatever they're doing that's frustrating or disappointing you, just roll back the clock and think, who was I mm-hmm. when I was 21? Did I watch four hours of soap operas a day? I did. Is that more or less equivalent <laughs> to watching TikTok for four hours? It is. Yes. Do I have a life full of purpose and connection? I do. <laughs> like relax, <laughs> whatever. It's not pretty. It's not as pretty as you think it's going to be. You're mm-hmm. not going to crack the code. <laughs> Nobody cracks the code. It's ugly. And people who say it's not ugly are big fat liars or they have like a magical kid. There are some magical kids out there that never give their parents an ounce of trouble, but. But they're the kids who are in our offices with anxiety. (laughs) Yeah. 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 They're they're playing the perfect game, which could kill a person. (laughs) Yes. You know? Okay, Kelly, we like to end with something food related. I don't want to end. I don't want it to end either. We want to ask you this question. What is a meal that defined your growing up? Or what's a meal that would define your kids growing up? 
I don't think my mom will ever listen to this. My mom's a really bad cook. <laughs> really bad. And um, so the meal that would define my growing up was that I would come home from school and in the time, I, we got out at 2.36, General Hospital started at three o'clock. Ooh, yes. I lived like a mile from school. So yes. I had like Luke and Laura, minutes. you were spending time with them. Luke and Laura, mm. love them. Mm-hmm. Robert Scorpio, Anna <laughs> DeVere. Anyway, I would make a huge pot of spaghetti that would like go edge to edge on a dinner plate, salt, butter, and just into like screeching into my sofa seat to watch General Hospital while I mowed through like enough spaghetti for three people. <laughs> so that is the meal of my childhood. Oh, so good. And, and when I'm sick, like I still crave spaghetti mm. with butter. We call it spaghetti then. It's pasta now. Um, mm. And then the I was a terrible cook. Like I, I don't know how to cook that well. And also I, I, I ended up working. I didn't really expect to, but the book came out and then it created all these opportunities and I couldn't resist any of them. So then I, I really worked hard when the kids were growing up and I traveled a lot. So I was a terrible cook. I hate going to the grocery store. So all that, I, I got like an F on that. And I'm not, not even kidding. It wasn't, it wasn't great. I'm, I'm, I'm sound like I'm so okay with it, but I really, it's a bummer. Anyway, the, the meal of choice was hummus with those baby carrots that get like all white and gross on the outside that get all dried out because <laughs> nobody closes the bag. And, and it, th- there's like an ongoing joke in our family that that's, you told me you love Thomas. That's the line. Because <laughs> I would come home with these ever larger things of hum- tubs <laughs> of Sabra hummus. Yes, that's that I'm like, this will last for like, 10 days and I have to go to North Carolina and Nashville and whatever. And then I'll be back and they'll still be eating the carrot and the hummus. (laughs) And so then Georgia was like, no more hummus. And I was like, you told me you loved hummus. (laughs) So that is the, that's the meal. Um, Like our friend, we have this hilarious friend, Lucy Barrett, who's right in between the two girls in school. And she's like a niece to me. And she would come in and open the fridge and there would be the carrots and the hummus and she'd say, classic Kelly. <laughs> it was so bad. Like I was like known for it. Uh, I, I think I'll think about you next time I have hummus and carrots. Certainly. Just, just, if it's not homemade, just bag it. Enough's <laughs> enough with the hummus. It just felt so healthy. I felt like I was like, this is amazing. It's like vegetables with vegetables. It's like yes. so funny. Kelly, thank you. I mean, what a so nice to meet you guys. Oh, it's just you good too. to be with you. And it feels totally appropriate that you were 10 seconds in sharing such truth. I mean, it's exactly what we would have guessed getting to have time with you. Thank you. So grateful for your time. If you are enjoying the Raising Boys and Girls podcast, click follow on your podcast listening app to subscribe and not miss an episode. Join us next time for another episode where we'll bring you help and hope on your journey of raising boys and girls. 